Welcome to the program we call Perspectives. I'm Professor Leon Blevins of the Department of Government here at El Paso Community College. I want to begin this program today by telling you a little bit of the distant past. I was teaching a class here at Community College in 1974, and in that particular class, I was talking about some cases of a Dr. Lawrence Nixon, an African-American medical doctor here who had been discriminated against in voting and took two cases successfully to the U.S. Supreme Court. As I discussed the cases, suddenly there was a booming voice at the back of the room, erupted in sound, and he began to say to me, I was discriminated against in voting in El Paso, and I asked, uh, well, what are you talking about? What was this? The gentleman that was shouting in the room named Nick Nelio. Uh, he told me at the end of the class the name of his lawyer that took the case to the U.S. Supreme Court. And a couple of days later, I was in Austin, Texas at a conference, standing in a cafeteria line, and there stood Wayne Wendell in front of me. So I introduced myself, and the three of us got together, and I did some research and published an article in Password Magazine of the El Paso County Historical Society, and it's uh, uh, volume 20, number two, summer of 1975. So I have the special guest of mine today, Nick Nelio and Wayne Wendell. Nick, tell me why you were so angry that day. Because the doctor wasn't the only one who had trouble voting in Texas. And what was the basis of your case? Well, they didn't allow the military to vote. The military at all? Regular military were excluded. That occurred because back when Texas was fighting for its freedom, the Commodore of the Texas Navy, in a name I can't remember. That's all right went to Houston and said, I think we ought to take New Mexico, Arizona, and California into the state of Texas and we'll become a big country. And Houston said, no, we can't do that. And he said, I don't care what you say, I've got enough votes, I can do it. So Houston had put in the Constitution that members of the military, regular military establishment could not vote. And it's been in the Constitution ever since. Oh until Wayne God. had it taken out. And you're talking about Sam Houston who became president of this? That's the man. Okay. Now, on, Wayne, what did he tell you that he was being discriminated against? Well, of course, when he called me, I remember the phone call. I knew him because he had been a juror on a case with me, so he called the house. I can remember I was standing in the bedroom and took the call, and he told me that they were not going to allow him to vote because he was a member of the armed forces and he did not join the armed forces while a citizen of this county. Mm -hmm. And that no members of the armed forces in Texas could vote in Texas unless they entered the military in that county. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I don't care if we have to go all the way to the Texas, to the U.S. Supreme Court, I'm going to fight it. <laughs> And I hung up the phone. I remember turned to the right where Janice was standing in the doorway. And I said, well, Janice, I just got my first U.S. Supreme Court case. And you certainly did. And it turned out that I certainly did. Okay, now how did this come to you, though? How did it relate to you? Well, see, I had been voting in, in, in El Paso. I'd gone and bought my poll tax mm -hmm. and, and, and voted. Had no, no difficulty with it at all. And then all of a sudden, some politician decided that they would make the election law agree with something else. I can't remember with the exactly Constitution, what. They, they decided no, to wasn't, it. wasn't the Constitution. In a previous law or something, yeah. And, and uh, that stopped the voting, even if you went and bought a poll tax and so forth. You weren't allowed to vote if you were in the military. And you had declared El Paso County as your place of residence, yeah, and right. now they're telling you you can't vote here anymore. That's right. Even though you had paid for a poll tax, and it caused you to get called for jury duty. That's correct. <laughs> okay. Well, then, Wayne, when you agreed to take the case, did he have much money to pay you to take a case to the Supreme Court? No, but from the very start, he told me not to worry about that because whatever it took, he would get it. <laughs> and he did. They had hot dog sales, cake sales. They formed their own military taxpayers association. They raised money from all over town. And frankly, I, my legal fees were $1,500 for the whole case, but there were expenses, mm -hmm. travel expenses, etc. And he and his wife and other members of that association did exactly what they said they would do. Do not worry about what it cost. 
you just get us the right to vote, we'll pay for it. Well, tell us about Sergeant Carrington comes into this picture, a sergeant working at White Sands, and he joined your Military Taxpayers Association, and he came into the picture. Tell us just briefly about that. Well, you see, uh, Fort Bliss didn't care too much about me being involved in this. Matter of fact, they didn't like it at all. Okay. <laughs> Carrington was from White Sands. That's in New Mexico. Okay. And they didn't much care what he did in Texas. Well, good for them. <laughs> and that's why uh, it was decided that he would be the case that we used. Mm -hmm. It really irritated me because I sort of kind of felt that uh, I was part of it. That you raised the issue. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the worst they could do was bust me. I come in the Army as a private. I guess I could have left as a private now if it you, was necessary. You entered the service in Delaware. and. Uh, Actually, he, New Jersey's right. Oh, entered, you were from Delaware, but I you entered Delaware, New Jersey. I was from Delaware, but I entered service in New Jersey. Oh, my goodness, complicated. And he was from Alabama. I think so, Yeah, yes. he was from Alabama. He now lives in California. Right. So then he comes into the picture, and Wayne, when you consulted with these two, what did you decide here? Well, first of all, I learned from Sergeant Niglio that he was getting in trouble, and so he suggested maybe we should try to find someone else. Well, Sergeant Carrington had sent a $12 contribution uh, toward the fundraising, and in the letter he said, you can use my name. Well, what we learned is he would not get in trouble by using his name, plus he did not, he was not in El Paso County because he was ordered to be here. Mm -hmm. He was stationed in New Mexico at White Sands. Therefore, he was here because he chose to live here. He owned a house here. He operated a business out of that house. And his wife could, of course, vote here, even though she was uh, born in Germany. <laughs> she was allowed to vote in all El Paso elections because she was not in the military. Mm -hmm. So that made it real clear that the only obstacle for, for servicemen was the fact that they were in the military. It had nothing to do with residence or anything right. of that nature. So he turned out to be almost the perfect uh, character to use. Uh, Sergeant Carrington's uh, name is on the case. It's Nick Niglio's case. Yeah, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Nick Niglio is the one who got the servicemen the right to vote in Texas. He, he's the guy that did it. It's not open for discussion. Now, now, your wife could still vote, but you couldn't vote here. That's correct. Only in Texas. <laughs> Only in Texas could you have Let's face it, it was a pretty easy case. I mean, now, I could handle that. Now, you argued those points you just made there before the U.S. Supreme Court, didn't you? I did. Uh, exactly. And, of course, uh, the Attorney General for the state of Texas was, they were the opposition in the case representing the state. And they made the same arguments that were the valid reasons, the, uh, I shouldn't say valid, the reasons for the law they argued, and truthfully, the people in the state were afraid that the members of the military would gain control, particularly in smaller communities where there's a large base, and they might control the elections. They might constitute a majority. Well, of course, they made that argument before the Supreme Court. Well, we can't let these servicemen vote because they might be a majority. Well, let's face it. Anybody in any county, I mean, it could be a religious group, it could be a group of employees, uh, it could be labor union group. I mean, that's what democracy is about, the majority rules. Right, right. And so they were saying, well, they might rule if they were the majority. Well, obviously, that was not a very good argument. And they had a lot of other points like that, that... Uh, one of their points is they said that other states denied servicemen the right to vote. And my argument was, well, if they do, their law is also unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, the argument was that uh, the people of Texas were afraid that the military would vote in a bond issue to have a highway go out to the base. People like Nick Nelio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and one of their arguments, uh, let's see, it was that... Uh, uh, they weren't interested. That This one I had a lot of fun with. The servicemen are not necessarily interested in voting in community affairs. And I said, well, this was my argument to the Supreme Court. The petitioner 
is here in the highest court of the land fighting for his right to vote. Is this court going to conclude that he cannot <laughs> vote because he doesn't have interest? I mean, that was pretty easy. Well, you know, one of the things that, that Nick was saying in my class and around campus was I was made a second class citizen. You remember that over and over? It oh, made you yes. so mad. Yes, I was second class and it irritated me. And you wanted to be a Texan. Amen. <laughs> and he did my say buckle that. Says Texas. Buckle says Texas. He, he did say that a lot back then too. That, and he was very sincere and properly so. He did feel like they had made him a second-class citizen. Mm -hmm. And you had help from other people here. Richard C. White, who became a congressman, and Alan That's Rash, right. who was a Republican uh, Party that chairman. That is true. Uh, uh, Alan Rash was the Republican Party chairman, and what was I was very active in the Democratic Party. Alan Rash and Tad Smith, who was also a county chairman here, in fact, a statewide Republican mm -hmm. chairman, they helped me prove up the necessary facts so that the case could get heard more quickly. Mm -hmm. And they were very, Alan Rash and uh, Tad Smith were both very helpful to me in that regard. And then Richard White, uh, because we were trying to save money, when I went to Washington, I was there about four days, and I stayed at his house the whole time. My wife and I both stayed there with uh, Richard and Kathy White. Now, with Dr. Nixon's cases, they started locally in federal court, went to New Orleans on appeal, then to Washington, D.C. And uh, when you did your research, you thought that was the way you would go, but you went a different direction. How did that happen? I found out that where elections are involved, there is an expedited procedure where you can actually file a writ of mandamus in the Texas Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go through any district courts, no trials. And so with the help of Alan Rash and others, we got the record together and the first hearing was in the Texas Supreme Court. And of course that meant that I had a right to appeal from there directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. So it did get, it was pretty quick overall. When you argued there, did you feel they were sympathetic to your arguments? No, <laughs> <laughs> except for, uh, there were two, two judges that were, Clyde Smith was one, and then the uh, Chief Justice Calvert. Both of them dissented for the reason that they thought the Texas law was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Okay. In other words, they felt like they, he was being discriminated against and that he deserved the protection of the U.S. Constitution. Well, obviously, that dissent helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. It was the Chief Justice for one thing, mm -hmm. so I was able to at least point out to the U.S. Supreme Court that the Chief Justice in Texas and one other believed that, that this state law was unconstitutional. So you went from the Texas Supreme Court simply to the U.S. Yes. Supreme Court. Now I remember the case, I told Nick this in 1974, that I had started teaching at Texas Western in 1965. And the decision was handed down March the 1st of 1965, and we were talking about it in political science classes at Texas Western, which is now UTEP. So the issue, as I remember it, was about residency. What do you have to do to declare residency? That was one of the concerns, and, and one of the arguments they made is that how would military people, how could the state determine whether or not they're a resident? And my answer was, the same way it determines everybody else. You look and see if they're of age, have a poll tax, which was required then, mm -hmm. and do they reside in the county? Everybody has to do that. Members of the military would be no different. As a practical matter, if they were worried about somebody who's living on base in the barracks, it's entirely possible that person could not prove his intent to be a resident here. Mm -hmm. But when you have people who own homes and are raising their family here, and have given up every other place of residence, they can prove residency. Uh, and so that was my argument. That, that really shouldn't be an issue, but it was one of the issues raised by the Attorney General's okay. office. I find it ironic that when Carrington's case was won, that he moved uh, to California soon after retiring. <laughs> he fled the state. <laughs> and this was, this was after all of my briefs after talking about how he's going to live here permanently. <laughs> he selected El Paso as his permanent home. Now, Nick, weren't you threatening to leave Texas if you lost the case? That already sold my home. I was fixing to go. You ready? But they were shipping you to Germany, weren't they? Didn't they send you? I got shipped ship? to Germany. Yeah. 
But you decided you didn't want to be in Texas anymore if they didn't want you voting here. That's right. <laughs> His wife, Dauphine, was going to move. I can remember that. <laughs> oh, I can identify with that. Any other uh, legal things that we should There's know? There's one, one that I'd Factor. like to bring up. Okay. Uh, this business about, you know, you can vote in the county in which you entered the service was mox nicks because when you tried to get a ballot from your county. Oh, yes. Okay. Good point. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know where you had your car registered. Right. <laughs> if you had your car registered here in El Paso, well, you're not from this county. So you were shut out anywhere in the country. They just shut out the military, period. Yeah, see, he couldn't vote anywhere. And there were hundreds like him right here in El Paso. They could not prove up a voting residence here but because in every way they had declared this to be their place of residence, <laughs> they couldn't prove up a place of residence anywhere else. Oh, my word. So they were disenfranchised entirely. Now, hadn't you fought, actively fought on the battlefields? Where did, where did you serve? You've served in World War II, Korea, mm -hmm. World Vietnam? War II, Korea. No, I didn't make Nam. They, they decided they could do that one without me. Oh, okay. But you, you, you fought, you served your country, and now you're a Texan, and they're telling you to go away. <laughs> Because you served your country. That's right. <laughs> I'd have been mad too. Did see? <laughs> I'd be ready. He to was. <laughs> I, I, I wrote to uh, the Kennedys, to Johnson, and uh, I got gobbledygook for an answer uh, from uh, the Attorney General. I got, uh, well, the primary issue with us is we're trying to make sure that all the blacks get an equal chance to vote. Mm -hmm. And I wrote back and said, well, black soldiers can't vote either. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, and then goodness. Johnson told me it was a state issue and he was vice pre or the vice president of the United States and he didn't want to get involved in state issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you left for a while and then you came back to Texas and you did retire in El Paso and you're still here with us. Okay? Amen. And, and we're proud of the service that you gave for your country and for this service and Wayne helping you to get this vote. Now, this case became a bit of a precedent for some other issues. I remember when I was teaching at West Texas State University in Canyon, which is now West Texas a &M, that there was an issue about 18-year-olds voting and whether they could register at the college dorm where they called it their residence or whether they had to register where their parents lived. And eventually, uh, I think it was an East Texas William Wayne Justice, an East Texas federal judge, in some cases from Denton, Texas, said that students could declare their dorm residence as their place of residence, legal residence for voting, or their parents, only one. And they cited, Carrington, he cited Carrington versus Rash. Wayne, have you heard of any others where your case was cited? Only I've heard that political science students will come up to me occasionally and say, didn't you handle this case that's in our textbook? Mm -hmm. And the reason it's in the textbook is because it has been cited as a precedent for voting rights in many, many other cases. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't really know of specific ones at, at, from time to time I've read them. No, right. But uh, uh, I do know that it, is, uh, it was cited as a president a whole lot more times than I realized it would be. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations. Now, Nick, you were here a student for several years, if I remember, very active, uh, student government and things like that. Uh, you'd like to say a word about community college and being a student here. Is, did it make a difference in your life? Did you learn anything? I learned <laughs> quite a bit. I, I, I learned a lot. One thing I learned about college is that I'm a lot deeper than I thought I was. Okay. And Another thing I learned was uh, I didn't know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you had a lot to learn. <laughs> uh, but I did take, uh, uh, see, I quit high school at 16. And I took college calculus without high school algebra oh and got an A. But I worked. Well, and you I were a fighter. Hard. You fought for what you could learn, and you fought in courts. You yeah. fought in the service. You, you had that fighting spirit. You know, let me say this. And I'm not saying it because he's here. I've said this to a lot of people for many, many years. The, I don't know any finer man uh, anywhere than Sergeant Niglio. Well. I've said that many times. He is really the type of person we think of when we say, here's what Americans are like. Loyalty to his family, loyalty to his country, and dedicated to the fight when his rights are trampled on. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't say it because he's here right. or we're on TV or right. anything. I've said it many times, and 
he's a Boy Scout leader uh, of the only retarded Boy Scout troop in the country. He has two sons, both of them Eagle Scouts, one of them the only retarded Boy Scout, Eagle Scout in the nation. Wow. This is not, a, <laughs> we're not sitting here with your average guy. This guy is a superior person in almost yeah. every respect. Well, now Mary Kay Wall, in her argument before the Supreme Court on behalf of the state of Texas, talked about voting being a privilege, not a right. How did you feel about that, Nick, when they told you it was a privilege? I laughed and said, according to the Constitution, it's my right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you fought for that right. Uh, it's a right and an obligation. We have an obligation to vote. And right. I don't, you probably remember that the, the time when you were turned away in uniform at the polling place, uh, it was a constitutional amendment vote, and we were voting in Texas to get rid of the poll tax as a voting requirement. And you and the other military had paid for poll taxes, put them in front of the people there handling the elections, and they said, you can't vote here. Go vote where you came from. That, that poor judge at, at, at the election, uh, she was in tears because she, <laughs> she had to turn me away. And I said, ma'am, it's not your fault. I'm, <laughs> I didn't do this to give you a hard time. It's just until I try it, mm -hmm. I don't know it can't be done. Uh, I remember Carrington's prim, a precinct location, uh, 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 Mrs. Hawkenberry, if I remember. That's that right. Saying. Margaret Hawkenberry was the election judge there, and she had been instructed by Alan Rash that they were going to be sued, but it's not suing you individuals, it's suing the state of Texas mm -hmm. to get this right to vote back. Right. You started to say. Well, I was just going to point out that both of them were wise enough to go to the poll in their full dress uniform, and they did it all. They had the cameras there. They got the publicity, which, of course, helped them in their movement, helped them to get other people to join he with them. He got Nick in trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, now, that was the <laughs> other side of the coin, but it did get the, this Military Taxpayers Association organization. It sort of launched that group uh, where there became, it got a lot of publicity mm -hmm. and uh, raised the money that was necessary for the trip. Mm -hmm. I'm finally going to tell a secret about the Military Taxpayers Association. Yes, I, I think I know what you're going to say. Tell us. My wife was president. Mrs. Carrington was vice president and treasurer. And I can't remember the other lady's name that was the secretary. Mm -hmm. That was the Taxpayers Association. You didn't belong to it because you were in the military and they, they were going <laughs> to ship you out, huh? <laughs> We were fighting a phantom, so I gave them a phantom to fight. Okay. Three people, and all of them civilians. But this, they did raise money from other people. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We take money from anybody to give it to us. <laughs> well, I knew Joe Yarbrough and Harry Rick that were in uh, uh, land development and real estate. And I remember the research that they gave the first sizable amount of money for your battle. And there was a concern that this, this is a military community. From right. the very beginning, it's since Fort Bliss, 1848, as a, as a base. And so they, they viewed this as a real problem. They did, you know. and, and business leaders like both of them uh, wanted El Paso to take the lead in getting the right to vote, and that's why they helped. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Nick, you want to? We have just a few minutes left. Any last no, thoughts I, about I, this case? I, I can remember one incident. I was standing in the uh, flu shot line. And some soldier come up to me and said, are you Sergeant Neo? I said, yeah, that, that's who I am. He said, report to the colonel. He wants to see you right now. I said, well, I, I'm, there's only about 10 or 12 in front of me. Can I stand here and get my shot and then report to the colonel? He said, the colonel said, now. Okay. We'll have to see the colonel. And I won't mention names. But he talked to me real nice about having me sit down I'm concerned about you and your money and, and uh, the way you're wasting your money with this taxpayers association that you've got going and and, and, and I, I just think it's not wise for you to, to get involved in this like you are. It's, it's a shame for you to waste your money like this. He said, you know, uh, I'm a native Texan that I can't vote. And I said, well, sir, when I get through, you'll be able to vote. <laughs> See, I'm, su I'm sure that's what he the said. The sergeant fighting for the colonel's <laughs> right to vote in Texas. Yes. And <laughs> I said, one more thing I'd like to tell you, sir. I've been in the Army 17 years, 
and you're the first regiment commander I've ever had that was worried about how I spent my money. You're a very unique individual, <laughs> sir. <laughs> oh, that's a good story. I like that one. Wayne, before we close out, any last thoughts about this very famous case that you took to the court on behalf of Nick? Well, of course, I've been grateful to him. I was grateful to him to have the opportunity back then and for years, it's, uh, you know, it's one of the most exciting and actually most fun experiences I've had as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it's all due to him uh, and his uh, desire uh, to just make sure that he got the right to vote. And it, it's like that first phone call, it, it's kind of ironic. He said, if I have to, we'll take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And I turned to my wife and of course, I thought I was joking at the time when I said, well, I just got my first Supreme Court mm -hmm. case, and uh, thanks to Sergeant Niglio and some others who helped us, uh, uh, it's it turned out to be a great thing, really, for El Paso uh, and for the military here, as well as, of course, military all over the state. I ran into somebody within the past year, a serviceman in San Antonio, who recognized my name. Uh, so, you know, I appreciated that. Uh, and now El Paso and Fort Bliss are growing. And can you imagine if we still had that law in effect and they're talking about bringing more military into El Paso, Texas, or in the state of Texas, that would be something else. And you know, if this case has done anything at all, it's given me something to talk about since 1974 <laughs> in all of my classes. Every semester, I can guarantee you, when I'm dealing with the electoral system and voting, and when I'm dealing with the judicial system, I bring up this particular case and use it as my classic example. So I have something to say thank you for, as well as thanking you for being on our program today. It's great. It's wonderful. Again, this program is perspectives. Most of the time, I'm interviewing people about politics, government, and the military, but occasionally we have other interesting guests on, so continue to watch us and stay tuned.